The 9,584th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is the situation in the Middle East, including the Palestinian question. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with, the, with Rule 37 of the Council's provisional rules of procedure, I invite the representative of Israel to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. Members of the Council have before them document S-2024-239, the text of the draft resolution submitted by the United States of America. The Council is ready to proceed to the vote on the draft resolution before it. I now give the floor to those members of the Council who wish to make statements before the vote. I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, for all the stories that have been written about divisions in this council, and there are many real divisions, I believe most of us share many of the same goals. First and foremost, we want to see an immediate and sustained ceasefire as part of a deal that leads to the release of all hostages being held by Hamas and other groups, and that will allow much more life-saving humanitarian aid to get into Gaza. Of course, we can't just want that to happen. We have to make that happen. We have to do the hard work of diplomacy. I know you've heard me say that a lot, and that's because it's the truth. A Security Council resolution means much less if it is not actually made real on the ground. That's why the United States, Egypt, and Qatar are working around the clock in the region to secure an immediate and sustained ceasefire as part of a deal that leads to the release of all hostages being held by Hamas and other groups that will help us address the dire humanitarian crisis in Gaza. We believe we're close. We're not there yet, unfortunately. And this moment is one where the Security Council has a critical role to play. By adopting the resolution before us, we can put pressure on Hamas to accept the deal on the table. Colleagues, you don't need me to tell you that every day without a deal, meaning every day without a ceasefire, leads to more needless suffering. For more than 100 hostages, including a one-year-old child being held in cap captivity by Hamas and other groups, for innocent Palestinians in Gaza, who have been displaced, who are starving, who desperately need peace. For Israelis who have continued to face missile attacks from Hamas, a terrorist group that set this conflict into motion on October 7th. Every day without a deal means more needless suffering. This resolution will move us closer to securing that deal and help us alleviate that suffering and I urge all council members to vote yes, to vote for a resolution that at long last condemns Hamas for its horrific terrorist attacks and sexual violence, that makes clear that all civilians, Palestinians and Israelis, should be able to live without fear of violence, that demands the protection of civilians in Gaza and stresses that a major ground offensive in Rafah poses a grave threat to civilians, even as we still work toward eliminating Hamas from all parts of Gaza, that calls on Israel to eliminate all barriers and restrictions to humanitarian aid, especially as the threat of famine looms large in northern Gaza, that condemns calls to resettle Gaza and makes clear that the Palestinian Authority should have ultimate authority over Gaza, and that reiterates this Council's support for a two-state solution. 
This is a strong resolution. It's the byproduct of exhaustive, inclusive negotiations. It reflects the consensus of this council. And it does more than just call for a ceasefire. It helps to make, that, make a ceasefire possible. It would be a historic mistake for the council to not adopt this text. And I again urge all council members to vote yes. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United States for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Russian Federation. <clears throat> Mr. President, the United Nations Security Council has for a half a year, six months, been unable to adopt a document with a demand for a ceasefire in Gaza. All of the attempts, time and again, came up against the resistance of the United States, who four times, in cold blood, cast a veto in this chamber. In this time, we have heard from U.S. colleagues repeatedly their justifications. Either they were saying that the achievement of a ceasefire is premature, insofar as there is a need to give space for so-called counterterrorism efforts of Israel, or they demanded for the Security Council not to stand in the way of effective diplomacy of Washington on the ground. I, that is a quote. Or they called for uh, us to wait for the onset of Ramadan when apparently an agreement would definitely be reached for a ceasefire, for an end to the violence. And now, six months have elapsed. Gaza has virtually been wiped from the earth. And now the U.S. representative, without blinking, has been asserting that Washington has finally begun to recognize the need for a ceasefire. This <clears throat> sluggish thought process in Washington has cost the lives, has been come at the cost of the lives of 32,000 peaceful Palestinians two-thirds of whom are women and children, and even now we have observed a typical hypocritical spectacle when wrapped up in a ceasefire, the United States have been trying to sell a product to the membership of the Security Council and to the entire international community. They've been trying to sell something completely different, namely a diluted formulation about a, deter about a definition and determination of the imperative for a ceasefire. This kind of uh, philosophical passages about moral imperatives uh, are seen in uh, limited quantities in the work of Immanuel Kant. However, to save the lives of peaceful civ uh, Palestinian civilians, this is not enough. And this is in no way what is stipulated in the mandate of the UN Security Council, the council which is vested with a unique mechanism to demand a ceasefire and were necessary to compel compliance therewith. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, during an official interview in Jeddah on the 20th of March with uh, the correspondent Al Haddad, stated, and I quote, well, in fact, we actually have a resolution that we put forward right now that's before the UN Security Council that does call for an immediate ceasefire tied to the release of hostages, and we hope very much that countries will support that, end quote. However, in the text of the U.S. draft, which has been put to the vote today, there is no such call. So what turns out is that either the U.S. representative at the United Nations or the U.S. Secretary of State have been deliberately misleading the international community. Distinguished colleagues, from the very onset, it was clear that the so-called negotiations which our U.S. colleagues have been engaged in on this issue have been focused gear, uh, me, merely to drag out the time. All of our comments, all of our red lines were time and time disregarded, as were the proposals of a number of other delegations. This was some kind of an empty rhetorical exercise rather than normal work on a document. The American product is exceedingly politicized, the sole purpose of which is to help to uh, play, into, play to the voters, to throw them a bone in the form of some kind of a mention of a ceasefire in Gaza. 
and to establish the U.S.'s political ambitions in the region through the establishment of terrorist labels and to ensure the impunity of Israel, whose crimes in the draft are not even assessed. I wish to draw attention to the following. The U.S. draft contains an effective green light for Israel to mount a military operation in Rafah. At the very least, the authors try to make it to such that nothing would prevent Western Jerusalem from continuing their brutal cleansing of the south of the Gaza Strip. And what is Washington actually trying to achieve? We have already stated that we will no longer tolerate pointless resolutions which do not contain a call for a ceasefire which lead us to nowhere. This draft should not pass with the majority of the membership to send a message about the in, uh, uh, admissibility, not the palliative, but uh, the actual intentions of Washington. It would be very strange for us to see uh, the, those members of the Council, of whom there are a majority, who understand this and who persuaded us of the deficiencies in the U.S. draft, it would be, we'd be surprised if they now lift their hands voting in favor of it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you do this, you will cover yourselves in disgrace. Consider once again, how will you look before the population of the Middle East in front of your own populations if you support this hypocritical initiative which is designed to disorient the international community and essentially to undermine the authority of the Council, uh, making sure that it cannot have an impact on the situation on the ground, that this council will not be able to have an uh, impact of the situation on the ground to ensure that it not get in the way of the White House. Are you willing to play into their hands when it comes to this unsavory spectacle? The Russian Federation will not do this. As a permanent member of the UN Security Council, as one of the founders of the United Nations, we recognize the historical global responsibility we shoulder for the maintenance of international peace and security. We cannot allow the Security Council to become an instrument instrument in the advancement of Washington's destructive policy in the Middle East. If this resolution is to be adopted, this would definitively close the door when it comes to discussions about the need for a ceasefire in Gaza. This would free the hands of Israel and it would uh, result in all of Gaza, in its entire population, having to face destruction, devastation, or expulsion. We are not guided by what is convenient for Washington and satellites, the satellites who raise their hands following instructions from Washington. We do not follow this. What, we, what guides us is what is necessary for the Palestinian people and what helps to advance peace. We call upon the membership of the Security Council not to allow this to occur, to vote against the U.S. draft. Mr. President, for the United Nations Security Council to ultimately be in a position to deliver upon its mandate for the maintenance of international peace and security, a number of non-permanent members of the Security Council have drafted an alternative draft resolution which stipulates black on white the demand for both a ceasefire and the unconditional release of hostages. This is a balanced and an apolitical document. We see no reason for which the membership of the Security Council, for the members of the Security Council not to support this, unless a ceasefire and the release of hostages is not part of their plans. This is an attempt to allow the Council to comply with the noble functions that have been vested in it. And I call for you not to let this opportunity slip away. Thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for their statement. I shall put the draft <coughs> I shall put the draft resolution to the vote now. Will those in will those in favor of the draft resolution contained in document S twenty twenty four two hundred thirty nine
please raise their hand. Those again, uh, those against. Abstention. <clears throat> the result of the voting is as follows. 11 votes in favor, three votes against, one abstention. The draft resolution has not been adopted owing to the negative vote of a permanent member of the Council. I now, I now give the floor to those members of the Council who wish to make statements after the vote. I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you again, Mr. President. Colleagues, today the, the United States put forward a resolution in good faith after consulting with all council members and after multiple rounds of edits. The vast majority of this council voted in favor of this resolution. But unfortunately, Russia and China decided to exercise its veto. And now, Russia and China will give you all sorts of explanations for its obstruction. But whether or not it will admit it, there are two deeply, deeply cynical reasons behind its votes. First, Russia and China still could not bring itself to condemn Hamas's terrorist attacks on October 7th. Can we just pause on that for a moment? Russia and China refuses to condemn Hamas for burning people alive for gunning down innocent civilians at a concert, for raping women and girls, for taking hundreds of people hostage. This was the deadliest single attack on Jews since the Holocaust. And a permanent member of this council can't even condemn it. I'm sorry, it's, it's really outrageous, and it's below the dignity of this body. The second reason behind this veto is not just cynical, it's also petty. Russia and China simply did not want to vote for a resolution that was penned by the United States because it would rather see us fail than to see this council succeed. Even after inclusive consultations over weeks and weeks, even after negotiations and edits produced a draft that received overwhelming council support. And as you saw today, nearly every council member voted to put the full weight of this body behind the diplomatic efforts to secure an immediate and sustained ceasefire as part of a deal that leads to the release of all hostages that will allow much more humanitarian aid to get into Gaza. But once again, Russia put politics over, progr over progress. Russia, who has carried out an unprovoked war on its neighbor, has the audacity and the hypocrisy to throw stones when it lives in a glass house itself. So let's be honest, for all the fiery rhetoric, we all know that Russia and China are not doing anything diplomatically to advance a lasting peace or to meaningfully contribute to the humanitarian response effort. Colleagues, there is obviously another resolution that some of you would like to be considered. But in its current form, that text fails to support sensitive diplomacy in the region. Worse, it, 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 it could actually give Hamas an excuse to walk away from the deal on the table. All of us want to see this council speak out, but we should not move forward with any resolution that jeopardizes the ongoing negotiations. And these are not just negotiations that are being carried out by the United States. Others in the region, Qatar and Egypt, are engaged on these negotiations. So if that alternative resolution comes up for a vote and does not support the diplomacy happening on the ground, we may once again find this council deadlocked. I truly hope that that does not come about. And so for our part, the, 
the United States will keep at it. We'll continue to work toward a deal alongside Qatar and Egypt. And we will work with any council member that is seriously interested in adopting a resolution that will help make that deal possible. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United States for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, President. The United Kingdom voted yes on the text before us this morning. We voted yes on the need for an immediate and sustained ceasefire to protect civilians, allow humanitarian aid in, and alleviate suffering. We voted yes on the call for an international humanitarian law to be upheld, for the release of hostages, to reject forced displacement, and to urge against a ground offensive in Tarafa. President, Palestinians are facing a devastating and growing humanitarian crisis, which will not improve until more aid can get in to Gaza. So we are deeply disappointed that Russia and China were unable to support this council to clearly and unequivocally state the need for an immediate and sustained ceasefire to that end. Through this resolution, the Security Council would have rightly and for the first time unequivocally condemned Hamas terrorist attacks. We're disappointed that the Council was not able to send this important message due to the vetoes cast by Russia and China. We welcome the patient and constructive consultation by the United States on this text. For our part, we will continue to do everything we can to get aid into Gaza as quickly as possible by land, sea, and air. But an immediate stop in the fighting is the only way to get aid into Gaza that is so desperately needed and make progress towards a permanent, sustainable ceasefire. I thank you. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for their statement. I give the, I give the floor to the representative of Algeria. Thank you, Mr. President. I address to you today not only as representative of Algeria, but also as a representative of the whole Arab world. Witnessing the unfolding tragedy in Palestine. Our region is devastated by the violence inflicted upon the Palestinian people. Live scenes of destruction and killing inflicting profound suffering are not bearable anymore. Since the beginning of the aggression against the Palestinian people, the Arab group have consistently called to put an end to this carnage. Only by ceasing hostilities we can alleviate the immense suffering and ensure that large-scale humanitarian assistance reaches those in need. For this purpose, we presented last month a draft resolution who garnered significant support within 
the Security Council, but it was ultimately vetoed. We firmly believe that its adoption could have saved thousands of lives of innocent people. It is beyond any doubt that Resolution 2712 and 2720 have fallen short due to the absence of a clear demand for a ceasefire. Those who believe that the Israeli occupying power will choose to uphold these, its international legal obligation are mistaken. They must abandon this fiction. Mr. President, since the circulation of this draft resolution over a month ago, Algeria has participated actively and in good faith in the negotiation process, proposing reasonable edit to achieve a more balanced and acceptable text. We acknowledge the effort made by the U.S. delegation, especially Ambassador Greenfield, in accommodating some of our proposals. However, our core concerns remained unaddressed, despite the many circulated revised versions. Throughout this process, we emphasized relentlessly the urgency of an immediate ceasefire to prevent further loss of life. We echoed the demand of millions of people and humanitarian actors for an immediate cessation of hostilities. Regrettably, the draft resolution falls short of our expectations. It fails to adequately address these main issues and the immense suffering enduring by the Palestinian people. Over five months, the conflict in Gaza has resulted in the tragic loss of life of more than 32,000 Palestinian lives, 32,000 Palestinian lives, more than 74 injuries, 74,000 injuries, with 12,000 suffering permanent disabilities. These are not mere statistics. They represent lives. They represent dreams. They represent hopes who have been destroyed. Alarmingly, the text avoid mentioning the responsibility of the Israeli occupying power. These individuals were not lost due to act of self-harm, they were killed. Their perpetrators must be held accountable. For us, in the Arab world, in the Islamic nation, in the whole world, Palestinians' lives undeniably matter. Mr. President, the text presented today 
does not convey a clear message of peace. It tacitly allows for continuing civilian, civilian casualties and lack clear safeguard to prevent further escalation. It is a laissez passer to continuing killing the Palestinian civilian. The emphasis on measures, I quote, on measures to reduce civilian harm from ongoing and future operation and future operation implies a license for continuing bloodshed. In this context, we are particularly concerned about a potential military operation in Rafa. Such a military operation would have devastating consequences. Algeria, along with other regional countries, has actively pursued reconciliation between Palestinian factions because we trust that a united Palestine is essential for its future, future and the future of the peace process. We believe that specific provision within the draft resolution jeopardize the future of the Palestinian state and hinder ongoing reconciliation efforts. Building a Palestinian state requires the collective effort of all its citizens, all its citizens, and the Security Council actions should support, not impede, this process. Mr. President, UNRWA. UNRWA plays a vital role in assisting Palestinian refugees not only in Palestine, but also in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Syria. It is a tool of regional stability. Any resolution undermining UNRWA mandates would exacerbate the already dear humanitarian situation. UNRWA continuing operation is essential until Palestinian refugees are able to sustain themselves or to return home as stipulated by international law. Mr. President, while supporting parallel efforts to end the bloodshed, this should not prevent the Council from demanding a ceasefire, a clear ceasefire to alleviate the Palestinian suffering. The Security Council duty is by the Charter to maintain international peace and security. It should be empowered to impose, to impose a ceasefire. For all this reason, Algeria voted against this draft resolution. Mr. President, we urge all Security Council members to prioritize the immediate cessation of hostilities 
the Security Council must take decisive and meaningful action to halt, to halt the violence and pave the way for a sustainable peace process in Palestine and also in the wider region. It is still within our capacity to act and urgently, urgently, I thank you. I thank the representative of Algeria for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of France. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, France thanks the United States for having proposed this resolution and we voted in favor of it. This Council must continue to act while the catastrophic humanitarian situation in Gaza is worsening every day. France calls for the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. It also calls for an immediate and lasting ceasefire. We therefore support the efforts of several elected members of this Council proposing a draft resolution along those lines and we welcome the fact that that resolution unreservedly supports ongoing efforts in Doha. France unreservedly supports these efforts. We call for the comprehensive respect for international law and the Geneva Conventions. This is an absolute requirement. France is opposed firmly to any Israeli offensive in Rafah that can only lead to a humanitarian disaster. There is also an urgent need for massive delivery of humanitarian aid to Gaza. The Ashdod port must be opened. The direct land link from Jordan and all crossing points. In line with our principles, France will continue to call this Council to condemn the terrorist acts committed by Hamas and other terrorist groups on the 7th of October. Last October, the vast majority of us had supported the Brazilian draft, which clearly outlined these acts. France recalls its commitment, its tireless commitment to Israel's security and its solidarity with the Israeli people, Israeli people following these attacks. These attacks cannot justify the unjustifiable suffering of the Palestinians in Gaza. France remains committed to a political settlement to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And we recall that only a two-state solution will ensure the security of Israel as well as the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people for a state. It is the duty of this Council to recall this, and that is why France will shoulder its responsibilities and will propose an initiative to the Security Council. Thank you. I thank the representative of France for their statement. I give the floor to the rep representative of the Republic of Korea. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. The Republic of Korea voted in favor of the draft resolution proposed by the U.S. As this includes positive elements that can plant the seeds for more sustainable peace in Palestine and Israel including support for the ongoing negotiations to achieve the release of hostages and an immediate ceasefire. The Republic of Korea reaffirms its firm position, calling for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, objecting to any ground operation in Rafah, and stressing the importance of the protection of civilians. Thus, we note with the appreciation that the draft resolution made it clear that an immediate and sustained ceasefire is imperative to protect civilians and alleviating humanitar alleviate humanitarian suffering. And we complement the efforts by the U.S. government to incorporate comments from the council members. This draft resolution proposed by the U.S. contains other important elements including support for diplomatic efforts to ensure ceasefire and the release of all remaining hostages, clear condemnation of all acts of terrorism, including the deplorable Hamas-led attacks of the 7th of October, and the concern over the ground offensive into Rafah, 
It also demands all parties to enable the full, immediate, safe, sustained, and unhindered delivery of humanitarian assistance to the civilian population throughout Gaza. In addition, it includes rejections of forced displacement, the establishment of so-called buffer zones, and new settlements in Gaza, as well as a commitment to the two-state solution. Thus, it is regrettable that another opportunity for this Council to forge a favorable response has failed to draw consensus. The Republic of Korea will continue to constructively engage with other members of this Council to reach a meaningful outcome in responding to the grave situation in Gaza. I thank you. I thank the representative of the Republic of Korea for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of China. Mr. President, China voted against the draft resolution that has just been put to the vote. And I would like to explain China's vote and relevant considerations as follows. More than 160 days have passed since the outbreak of the Gaza conflict. In the face of a human tragedy in which more than 32,000 innocent civilians have lost their lives and millions are suffering from famine, the most urgent action to be taken by the Council is to promote an immediate, unconditional and sustained ceasefire. This is the universal call of the international community. The decision taken by the emergency special session of the General Assembly a few months ago and a solemn appeal by the Secretary General of the UN to the Council while invoking Article 99 of the Charter. The Council has dragged its feet and wasted too much time in this regard. We all recall that the U.S. introduced its own draft resolution after vetoing on February the 20th the overwhelming consensus among council members on an immediate ceasefire. Over the past month, the draft has undergone several iterations and contains elements that respond to the concerns of the international community, but it has always evaded and dodged the most central issue, that of a ceasefire. The final text remains ambiguous and does not call for an immediate ceasefire, nor does it even provide an answer to the question of realizing a ceasefire in the short term. This is a clear deviation from the consensus of the Council members and fell far short of the expectations of the international community. An immediate ceasefire is a fundamental prerequisite for saving lives, expanding humanitarian access, and preventing greater conflicts. The U.S. draft, on the contrary, sets up preconditions for a ceasefire, which is no different from giving a green light to continued killings, which is unacceptable. The draft is also very unbalanced in many other aspects, in particular with regard to Israel's recent and repeated declarations of plans for a military offensive on Rafah, the draft does not clearly and unequivocally state its opposition, which would send an utterly wrong signal and lead to severe consequences. Any action taken by the Security Council should stand the test of history and the scrutiny of morality and conscience. With a view to safeguarding truth and justice, safeguarding the UN Charter, its purposes and principles, and safeguarding the di dignity of the Council, and also based on the concerns and strong opposition from the Arab states. With this draft resolution, China, together with Algeria and Russia, have voted against the draft resolution. Mr. President, members of the Council have now before them another draft resolution that was the result of collective consultations among elective members of the Council. This draft 
is clear on the issue of a ceasefire and is in line with the correct direction of the Council's action and is of great relevance. China supports this draft. We hope that the members of the Council will reach agreement on this basis as soon as possible and send a clear signal calling for an immediate ceasefire and on the end of the fightings. Like other members, China has, from the outset, called for the immediate release of all hostages, a demand repeatedly reiterated in the Security Council resolutions 2712 and 2720. We welcome the mediation efforts by Egypt, Qatar and others to this end. And we hope that all detainees will be released at an early date. China rejects the accusations by the U.S. and the U.K. against China's voting position. They are groundless accusations. If the U.S. were serious about ceasefire, it wouldn't have vetoed time and again multiple council resolutions. It wouldn't have taken such a detour and played game of words while being ambiguous and evasive on critical issues. If the U.S. is serious about a ceasefire, then please vote in favor of the other draft resolution clearly calling for a ceasefire so that a ceasefire can be finally and immediately achieved. The Palestinians, their sufferings can be alleviated and ended and hostages be released without delay at an early date for the U.S., at the current stage, what is most important is not words, but their deeds, their actions. No matter what, China will continue to work with council members and the international community to play a responsible and constructive role in order to achieve ceasefire and put an end to the war, implement a two-state solution, alleviate the suffering of the catastrophe, and promote a comprehensive, just and lasting solution to the question of Palestine. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of China for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Malta. Thank you, President. Malta thanks the United States for their efforts and consistent engagement on this draft resolution. Malta voted in favor of the text, and we regret that the use of the veto has prevented its adoption. We believe that this draft would have represented another important step in the right direction and would have continued to build upon resolutions 2712 and 2720. Malta remains firm in its position that an immediate and permanent ceasefire is the only avenue through which we can prevent a further deterioration and begin addressing the impact of the Israeli-Hamas war. We support and appreciate ongoing efforts by Egypt, Qatar and the United States to negotiate a deal which allows for the release of hostages. We will continue to reiterate our call on Hamas to release all hostages safely and unconditionally. We welcome that the draft condemned the heinous Hamas terror attacks of 7 October, including the taking of hostages and sexual violence committed. We recognize that this text emphasizes concerns on a ground offensive into Rafah and the catastrophic consequences this will cause for 1.5 million, the majority of whom are women and children. However, we underline that the Council cannot be perceived to authorize and any ongoing or future Israeli military operations into Rafah in any way. We stress our firm rejection of any ground offensive into Rafah and believe the draft should have had stronger and more reassuring language on this matter. We also underline the fact that a forced displacement of the Palestinian civilian population from and within Gaza would amount to grave breaches of international law. Malta continues to be gravely alarmed at the ever-increasing humanitarian toll of this war, which also persists during this holy month of Ramadan. We firmly reiterate our call for Israel to ensure the immediate, safe, 
sustained and unhindered delivery of adequate and desperately needed aid to the people in Gaza. We must do our utmost to alleviate the suffering of the civilians in Gaza. We also repeat our call for the full implementation of resolutions 2712 and 2720. Malta remains deeply concerned about the ongoing situation in the region. We reiterate that an immediate and permanent ceasefire remains a priority to de-escalate this gravely concerning spiral of violence and regional escalation. In closing, President, Malta reaffirms its steadfast commitment to achieving comprehensive peace in the Middle East. This demands a two-state solution, where Israel and Palestine, as two democratic states, peacefully coexist side by side within secure and recognized borders, in line with the relevant Security Council resolutions and internationally agreed parameters. Thank you. I thank the representative of Marta for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Guyana. Thank you, Mr. President. After five months of war in Gaza and the horrific attacks of 7 October 2023, this Council has still not been able to adopt a text that addresses all the dimensions of the conflict in a manner that impacts the situation on the ground and upholds the rule of law. While Guyana welcomed the U.S. initiative to develop a draft resolution and the transparency with which the negotiations were conducted, we are of the view that given the length of time spent on those negotiations and certain positions consistently expressed by several delegations, the draft could have better reflected the broad-based feedback. Mr. President, dear colleagues, Guyana abstained on this draft resolution for a number of reasons, which I will elaborate. First, contrary to some media and other reports, this resolution does not call for an immediate ceasefire. Instead, we note that it, and I quote, determines the imperative for a ceasefire, end of quote, and calls for support for diplomatic efforts that are ongoing outside of the UN. While those efforts must be commended, given the responsibility and mandate of this Council, Guyana could not support a resolution that does not unequivocally call for an immediate ceasefire. Nearly 32,000 persons have been killed in Gaza since 7 October, the majority of whom are women and children. More than 74,000 have been maimed. Initial UN assessments have concluded that it would take years to clear 23 million tons of rubble and unexploded weapons scattered across Gaza. The latest IPC report projects famine between now and May 2024. In summary, this man-made disaster cannot be halted without an immediate ceasefire, and it is this Council's responsibility to unequivocally demand one, even as it acknowledged the efforts of Qatar, Egypt, and the United States. Second, the demand for a ceasefire should not be linked to or conditioned on the release of hostages. The taking of hostages is strictly prohibited on the international law, and their release must be unconditional. Guyana reiterates its call for the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. Two wrongs cannot make a right, and the Palestinian people should not be collectively punished and themselves held hostage for the crime of others. Third, in our view, this text lacked attribution in a number of key areas. While the draft includes the condemnation of Hamas for the October 7th attacks and demands they immediately grant humanitarian access to the hostages, and rightfully so, there is no attribution or demands to the Israeli authorities for what is taking place in Gaza. For example, who is responsible for 1.5 Palestinians taking refuge in Rafah? And who has announced a planned military ground offensive there? To whom is the demand for compliance with obligations on the international law regarding the protection of civilians and civilian objects, humanitarian access, and the protection of humanitarian relief and medical personnel, their assets and infrastructure applicable? 
who has erected and maintained the existing barriers to the provision of humanitarian assistance at scale? Who is responsible for the forcible displacement of the civilian population in Gaza? Who is preventing the use of all available routes to and throughout the entire Gaza Strip? Who does not respect the confliction and notification mechanisms? We know the answers to these questions. We have heard briefer after briefer, both from the UN system and civil society, describe the situation on the ground, explaining where the problems are and who is responsible for creating these problems. Why then were the relevant demands in the resolution not clearly addressed to the occupying power? Not even once was this done. Indeed, if one were to read this resolution without background knowledge, it would be difficult to ascertain which party in this conflict is committing the atrocities in Gaza, atrocities which necessitated this draft resolution being put forward. In a resolution of 41 paragraphs, 2,036 words, the occupying power is mentioned once in the penultimate paragraph. Fourth, preambula paragraph seven was of particular concern to Guyana. This council is the organ with the charter responsibility for addressing threats to peace, breaches of the peace, and acts of aggression. How can we endorse the idea of, and I quote, ongoing and future operations, end of quote, in Gaza, as long as measures are taken to, and I quote again, reduce significantly civilian harm, end of quote. This idea was rejected by several delegations during the course of the negotiations. In Guyana's view, this is in direct contravention of the Council's responsibility. It would set a dangerous precedent and make the Council complicit in the atrocities being committed in Gaza now and in the future. Fifth and final, we took note of the four paragraphs treating with the mandate of the Senior Humanitarian and Restruction Coordinator for Gaza. While we applaud the coordinator's efforts, we are of the view that the scale of efforts that would be required in Gaza after the war would warrant a key role for UNRWA, given its decades of experience in the Strip and its capacity vis-a-vis -vis other agencies operating there. This Council has heard many times of the indispensability of UNRWA. It is the lifeline for Palestinians. We were, therefore, disappointed that the only mention of UNRWA in the draft pertain to the investigations into the allegations against a small number of its staff. Guyana, supported by several delegations, had requested an affirmation of UNRWA's important mandate in the text, but this was not taken on board. Mr. President, dear colleagues, this Council still has an opportunity to take action to end the suffering of all parties. Civilians in Gaza need a respite. Palestinians need a respite. Israelis need a respite. Both need a respite from this continuous cycle of violence and pain. That is the real window of opportunity, the strong desire by the people of Palestine and Israel for peace. Guyana is prepared to work with other council members to respond to their needs and legitimate aspirations, including, very important, the two-state solution. This must not be postponed. I thank you. I thank the representative of Guyana for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Slovenia. Thank you very much, Mr. President. A month after our last vote, I will repeat my words. We voted for the resolution because the killing and starving of civilians in Gaza must stop and the suffering of hostages and their families must end. We voted in favor of the resolution because we believe it is imperative for the Security Council to send a clear message that the situation in Gaza is unacceptable. We deeply regret the use of the veto by the Russian Federation and China. We thank the United States for their efforts on this draft resolution. The draft offered the Council an opportunity to follow up on several harrowing briefings that we have received in the last month. The resolution didn't include all of the elements that we would have wanted to see in the text. However, it provided us an opportunity 
to express ourselves on a number of particularly concerning aspects of the crisis in Gaza, and they include the importance of achieving an immediate and sustained ceasefire, the need to release hostages, a clear stance against an offensive in Rafah and its serious implications for regional peace and security, the urgency of removing roadblocks to humanitarian assistance, including the need for increased provision and distribution of humanitarian aid, the need for respect of international law and protection of civilians and civilian objects, the need for protection of humanitarian relief and medical personnel, the rejection of an attempt at territorial or demographic change of Gaza, including forced displacement, and the commitment of the Council to the vision of the two-state solution. Many of these elements have been extensively elaborated during our num numerous meetings and briefings on Gaza. As emphasized on those occasions, we believe in the complementarity of all efforts, bilateral, regional, and those of the Council. We therefore once again thank the leaders of Egypt, Qatar, and the United States for their efforts in securing a deal on the ground. Slovenia is of the view that a strong signal of support from the Council to the negotiations on the ground could provide an important impetus to the process and bring us closer to lasting peace. We continue condemning the terrorist attack of Hamas on 7 of October and call for the immediate and unconditional release of hostages. Hamas did set this in motion, but it didn't have to end with over 32,000 killed Palestinians, the rest of them starving, and the massive violations of international humanitarian law. War, with all its tragic consequences, is a choice, not a necessity. We underscore the need for accountability and adherence to international law. And we would like to once again express our deep concern over the statements of Israeli officials regarding resettlement of the people of Gaza and reject a possible ground invasion in Rafah. We regret the Council was once again unable to send a clear signal on the need for this conflict to end in order to then continue its work on the political solution and the vision of the two-state solution. We reiterate our call for full respect of international law, including international humanitarian law and human rights law of the provisional measures of the International Court of Justice and resolutions 2712 and 2720. The Council needs to demonstrate leadership in pursuit of peace. Slovenia will continue its engagement with all Council members to find a united voice from the Council. For Slovenian, Palestinian lives matter. For us, Israeli lives matter. This conflict must end. Thank you. I thank the representative of Slovenia for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Switzerland. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. Switzerland voted in favor of the draft resolution submitted by the United States of America, and we regret that it was not adopted due to the veto of two permanent members of the Security Council. In light of the situation, the horrific unbearable suffering on the ground, it would have been necessary for the Council to achieve a tangible result and to send a signal of inability to act and clear unity for the protection of civilians. All of the members of the Security Council contributed to the numerous consultations on the text put to the vote today, and I thank the United States for their efforts. Right up until the last minute, however, Switzerland argued for its content to be clearly to clearly reflect the request made repeatedly by a very large majority of council members for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire to be established without any preconditions. It is high time for an equivocal request for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire to be subject of consensus at this Security Council. In light of the catastrophic humanitarian situation in which civilians find themselves in Gaza, first and foremost, children and hundreds of thousands of displaced persons who are enduring bombardment, the risk of famine and epidemics. In light of that, such a ceasefire remains a priority, urgent necessity now. The delivery of humanitarian assistance, which the entire population of Gaza needs now, needs to take place in a expeditious, safe, and unimpeded way. We note that the U.S. text does not explicitly call for the immediate and unconditional 
unconditional release of hostages, a demand that a large majority of the Council members, including Switzerland, has cons have consistently made since the acts of terror perpetrated by Hamas on 7 October. Switzerland welcomes the condemnation of these acts in the text. Lastly, Switzerland remains very much concerned about the humanitarian consequences of the current hostilities. A major military offensive in Rafah would significantly worsen the already catastrophic plight of the civilian population and would generate new major obstacles to the delivery of humanitarian assistance. This is a prospect that is unacceptable and it cannot be endorsed by this Council. Furthermore, today's failure under no circumstances should be interpreted as a message for the parties to continue hostilities. For this reason, Switzerland remains committed, uh, including with the elected members of the Security Council, to facilitating rapid action by the Council. We encourage and facilitate all of the negotiations initiatives carried out by the U.S., Egypt, and Qatar. It also remains our duty to see to it that these obligations under international law, in particular international humanitarian law and human rights, for these obligations to be respected by all parties under all circumstances, even in the absence of resolutions from the Council, in, this is necessary to protect and assist civilian populations. Switzerland remains committed to unified action aimed at bringing this conflict to an end, and we are committed to reestablishing a political horizon in a accordance with our mandate for the maintenance of international peace and security. Thank you. I thank the representative of Switzerland for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Sierra Leone. <coughs> Mr. President, <coughs> today the Security Council has considered the draft resolution presented by the United States as part of the Council's efforts to fulfill its responsibility under the Charter of the United Nations to maintain international peace and security. We acknowledge the time and effort dedicated by the United States to ensure we have a resolution that could address the current situation on the ground as it relates to the ongoing hostilities in the Gaza Strip since the attack of 7th October 2023. Despite the serious difficulties we have with some provisions of the text, Sierra Leone voted in favor of the draft resolution to demonstrate commitment to achieving a sustainable cessation of hostilities, even if incremental in approach and dependent on diplomatic negotiations outside of the United Nations. The text placed before the Council by the pen holder did not call for an unambiguous immediate ceasefire and an unconditional release of the hostages. With the unfolding catastrophe, tragic and massive scale of killings and human suffering in Gaza, Sierra Leone has committed to support initiatives that will lead to a ceasefire. Our vote, therefore, was informed by the need to support actions that could lead to an immediate and sustained ceasefire, alleviate human suffering, stop forced displacement of Palestinians, and allow for the delivery of essential humanitarian assistance, including medical supplies, water, food, beddings, and shelter. Our vote is also indicative of the urgent need for all hostages held by Hamas to be immediately released. With our vote, we underscore the urgent need for an expanded and unimpeded humanitarian assistance to civilians in the entire Gaza Strip, especially at this critical moment of acute food insecurity in the Gaza Strip and the imminent risk of famine. As a firm proponent for consistency in complying with international law, Sierra Leone welcomes the call for parties to the conflict to comply with the obligations under international law, including international humanitarian law, with regard to the conduct of hostilities and protection of civilians and civilian objects. While we regret that the current text was not adopted due to the incorporation of elements that could be misinterpreted and which lacks the Council's consensus, this setback notwithstanding, as a Council, we must continue our pursuit of peace. Our quest for a solution to the ongoing catastrophic humanitarian situation is to rescue the 17,000 unaccompanied children in the Gaza Strip, over 1.4 million internally displaced persons, the wounded, women and other vulnerable groups from untimely deaths and untold suffering. Sierra Leone will continue to recognize the key role of UNRWA and all UN humanitarian agencies in providing life-saving assistance to the civilian population 
and offer our support to the Senior Humanitarian and Reconstruction Coordinator for Gaza. When the guns are silent and we are at the critical point, it's our firm view that the people of Palestine should be given the liberty to determine their political status and future. We emphasize that all engagements regarding the reconstruction of the Gaza Strip must be conducted in good faith and with the active participation of the Palestinians. I thank you. I thank the representative of Sierra Leone for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Ecuador. Gracias, señor. Thank you, Mr. President. Ecuador voted in favor of the draft resolution which we have just considered. We share the need for urgency for the Council to act in the face of the catastrophic humanitarian situation of the uh, Palestinian population in Gaza on the brink of famine and being forced to uh, go elsewhere. We voted in favor of a resolution which is the fruit of a lengthy negotiation process in which all members of the Council participated. It is, above all, a resolution in which the Council determines that a, an immediate ceasefire is required, but it also contains other elements of considerable importance, relevance, and urgency, including medium and long-term measures uh, on the path to lasting peace. The text also includes as explicit condemnation for the Hamas terrorist attacks and the taking of hostages. Ecuador reiterates the demand that these hostages be released immediately, unconditionally. Mr. President, I'm convinced that each of us, each member of this Council, believes that the text could be improved upon. But I'm also fully convinced that we would never agree on which part needs to be improved upon or how to do it. In such a complex situa situation, a perfect text for everyone is impossible. Mr. President, the Council must not be hostage to political rivalries. We should be a space for building reconciliation and peace. In the framework of a clear-cut mandate received in the UN Charter, and so once again we regret that the majority decision of the Council has not been respected due to the use of the veto. Thank you. I thank the representative of Ecuador for their statement. <clears throat> I shall make a statement in my capacity as a representative of Japan. Over five months have passed since Hamas' horrifying acts of terror took place in Israel, which has led to the unfolding of the tragedies the world has been witnessing in Gaza. At least 32,000 Palestinians have been reportedly killed by Israel in Gaza most of them women and children. Farming is on, on the brink, and the looming Israeli military offensive into Rafah only threatens to deepen the humanitarian catastrophe. This should not proceed under any circumstances. Given the gravity of the situation on the ground, Japan voted in favor of this draft resolution. We deeply regret that it failed to be adopted. Japan appreciates the tireless efforts of the United States in consulting with all Council members throughout the negotiation process. Had it been adopted, this resolution could have pushed forward ongoing vigorous diplomatic efforts, in particular the four-party four talks, towards an immediate and sustained ceasefire and the release of hostages. We believe that this would be a pragmatic approach to improve the humanitarian situation on the ground. Although we were unable to adopt the resolution, the Council must put pressure on the parties to conclude the deal as soon as possible. Those in Gaza and beyond cannot wait another day. I thank you. I resume my function as President of the Council. The permanent representative of Russian Federation has asked for the floor to make a further statement. I give them a floor. Mr. President, the Rus we have now just heard, we have heard hypocritical 
statements from a number of members of the Security Council, from some members of the Security Council who have been shedding crocodile tears about the Russian and Chinese vetoes. We explained the reasons behind our not allowing the resolution to pass, and it by no means is because of the U.S. delegation, what has been portrayed by the U.S. delegation, not what uh, the U.S. representative tried to persuade us about. I told all of you that you would be covering yourselves with disgrace voting for the U.S. text, which for you including those who are uh, per vaunting it, was unacceptable. Do you want me to tell you how things actually were? It's not difficult to see. It's not at all complicated. Your U.S. Uh, lords and protectors uh, beyond uh, wringing the hands of your leaders in capital they told you that you should not be worried because the Russian Federation would veto this in any way, but you would not go against the U.S. text. That is it. That's the whole scenario. So don't try to hypocritically tell us that you are now disappointed that Russia and China vetoed the resolution. Once again, today you have covered yourselves with disgrace, voting for a text which you yourselves do not support and did not support. I, th I thank the representative of Russian Federation for their statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Israel. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude to the United States of America. The United Nations was established in the wake of the Holocaust to prevent such atrocities from happening again. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, thank you for defending these values. Your determination to condemn the Hamas monsters and your conviction that the release of the hostages is not something that can be postponed shows true moral clarity. The American resolution, should it have passed, would have marked a moment of morality for the UN, a place where good is evil and justice is injustice. It would have been the very first time that this council or any UN body condemned Hamas and their brutal massacre. Yet sadly, for purely political reasons, this resolution did not pass and terrorists can continue benefiting from this council whitewashing their crimes. Colleagues, how can we explain to children around the world that the body mandated to uphold global peace and security refuses to condemn terrorists for the most horrific crimes? The Council's decision to not condemn Hamas is a stain that will never be forgotten. Colleagues, as Israel defends its very future against those that seek our annihilation, all UN bodies have dedicated their discussions only to the situation in Gaza and the civilian casualties. Numbers supplied by the terrorists are thrown around and quoted as if they are word of God. Yet in essence, these numbers are merely the lies of Hamas that the UN is so quick to parrot. The time has come to put an end to this myth. Hamas knows that they cannot defeat Israel militarily. Their goal is to annihilate Israel, and their strategy is to terrorize our civilians while weaponizing the international community to tie our hands in order to ensure their survival. And how do they do it? They use Gazans as human shields in an effort to maximize civilian casualties, knowing that it will lead this council to pressure Israel into ending the military operation. Remember, please remember, for Israel, every civilian death is a tragedy. For Hamas, civilian deaths are a strategy. And sadly, you are playing into Hamas's strategy exactly as they predicted. Israel is a law-abiding democracy. We take every effort to minimize collateral damage. Israel has gone above and beyond to ensure the safety of civilians. We drop warning leaflets, make tens of thousands of phone calls, and provide Gazans with military maps de detailing safe corridors. 
Israel has taken steps that no other military in any other conflict, any other conflict, has ever taken, all in order to mitigate civilian casualties. Hamas, on the other hand, built for years hundreds of miles of terror tunnels in which terrorists hide and our hostages are held. Why do they do it? Hamas does exactly this in order to exploit Gazan civilians as human shields and to increase the death toll. For Hamas, more murdered civilian, civilians is key to their survival. It's their path towards a ceasefire that will keep them in power. So ask yourself if you're not helping them with their strategy. So Hamas, through the Gaza Ministry of Health that it controls, provides false statistics which are then parroted around the globe, promoting the lies of terrorists. By merely looking, only looking at the Hamas numbers, it is crystal clear that they cannot represent reality. A statistic professor from Wharton Business School recently released an, an analysis of the Hamas, uh, sorry, Gaza Ministry of Health numbers pro proving that not only are they distorted, but they are also inflated. They have no possible basis in reality. But even if we were, we were to take Hamas's falsified numbers at face value, the non-combatant to combatant ratio in Gaza is roughly one to one. This is the lowest ratio in the history of urban warfare. Every civilian death in Gaza, as I said, is tragic, but the only party to blame is Hamas. Yet the Security Council refused to hold Hamas accountable for deliberately putting Gazans in the line of fire. Condemn the tunnel under schools. Condemn the exploitation of hospitals for terror. Hold Hamas accountable. The same can be said about the libelous narrative of famine in Gaza. This, too, is Hamas propaganda, which the UN has chosen to embrace. There is absolutely no limit, no limit that Israel places on humanitarian aid entering Gaza. And to date, 300,041 tons of aid on over 18,283 trucks have entered the Strip. Any country that wishes to provide more aid is more than welcome, and we will facilitate its entry. The only reason why any Gazan lacks aid is because Hamas loots it and steals much of it for themselves. As long as Hamas is in control, Gaza's economic situation will be in ruin. Colleagues, this council has expressed its concern over an operation in Rafah, but let me be clear. There is no country, no country that seeks to avoid an operation in Rafah more than Israel. Is it your sons and daughters that you are sending into battle? No, it is our children who are making the ultimate sacrifice in defense of their homeland. From the outset of the war, Israel's goal has been clear. Return the hostages, dismantle Hamas's terror capabilities, and ensure that Gaza no longer poses a threat to Israel. So far, Israel has succeeded in dismantling roughly 18 of Hamas's battalions, but there are four remaining battalions in Rafah, with around 8,000 terrorists. Israel is fighting for her future, and if we fail to achieve our goals, Hamas will repeat October 7th again and again, as they promised publicly. Not only Hamas, by the way. Terror will prevail in our region, and this will inspire jihadist organizations all across the globe. So the only way, the only way to achieve a real and permanent ceasefire is to eliminate Hamas's capabilities entirely. And this cannot happen unless all of their battalions are demolished. You cannot extinguish a fire by putting out most of it. The fire will grow again and spread. This is what will happen without an operation in Rafah. Israel sees no alternative. The road to a permanent ceasefire passes through Rafah. If this council has any other ideas how to dismantle the terror group without entering Rafah, we would love to hear them. We are open. Colleagues, 
Once Hamas capabilities are dismantled, Israel's goal to demilitarizing Gaza can materialize. But for a lasting solution between Israel and Gaza, there is another requirement, de-radicalization. According to a recent poll by the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey, the Palestinian Center Research, 71%, I repeat, 71% of Palestinians support Hamas's October 7th massacre. It's not only a minister saying this or that, as you quote here. 71% of the Palestinian people support the massacre. And over 60% of Palestinians want to see Hamas in control of the Gaza Strip. Can you comprehend this? The vast majority of Palestinians support Hamas's massacre and wish to keep these rapist murderers in power. This, colleagues, is the root of the problem. Whoever ignores this deep-seated hatred and makes demands of Israel, only Israel, by the way, is burying their head in the sand like an ostrich. Just as the UN has done since Israel disengaged with Ru from Gaza in 2005. For 18 years, the UN has turned a blind eye to Hamas's bigotry, incitement, and radical indoctrination to terror that is rampant in schools across Gaza, by the way, including in UNRWA schools. We hear calls for two states, for peace, yet the UN refuses to address the underlying issue. The vast majority of Palestinians are not looking for peace. What is most important to them is Israel's annihilation at any cost. This is why de-radicalization is key. By making one-sided demands of Israel without making any demands of the Palestinian, Palestinians to end their culture of hate and incitement, a long-term solution will never be possible. Demand that the Palestinian Authority combat terror. Demand that they end incitement. Demand that they stop paying salaries to terrorists. Demand that they de-radicalize the people. The educational transformation that the German people underwent after the Third Reich was toppled is what the Palestinians need to receive so that they finally support coexistence. Coexistence with Jews. Coexistence with Israel. That's how we educate our kids. Mr. President, the war may be in Gaza, but this war extends much, much further than our battle against Hamas. The true puppet master directing Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, all of them to attack us and their, their militias is, as you all well know, is Iran. Iran is the architect of instability and its ambitions of world domination must be stopped. The Ayatollah regime is determined to wipe Israel off the map, and they are not ashamed to say it publicly. Tomorrow, dear colleagues, the Jewish people will celebrate the holiday of Purim. And this holiday is a very important message to the murderous Ayatollah regime and the rest of the world. 1,500 years ago, in Persia, which is modern-day Iran, the king signed a disastrous decree a resolution calling to annihilate all the Jews in his empire. Following this catastrophic decision, the Jewish people banded together and through conviction and faith, they succeeded in reversing this resolution, gaining the right of self-defense. As a result, the Jewish people defeated all those who set out to murder them, and the man behind this evil plot was executed. This is the story of Purim, our holiday. And the holiday slogan is Venahafohu, and the opposite happened. Those who plotted against the Jewish people had their own schemes turned against them. This is the essence of Jewish history. The very same faith and conviction that the Jews of Persia displayed has been carried with us to this day. This is why we have survived and thrived, despite all of the decrees and racist resolutions against us throughout history. Many have tried to destroy us, but all have failed, because we will never surrender and we will always fight for our existence. Members of this council called for a ceasefire in honor of the Muslim holiday of Ramadan. We respect Ramadan, but Hamas's massacre was carried out on the Jewish holiday of Simchat Torah, 
the holiday where we mark the completion of the reading of the Old Testament, the Torah. So today, in order of Purim, the request of the Jewish people is that this council takes real, real and active measures to release all of our hostages. And if we are successful, if the hostages return home and Hamas is dismantled, then just as it says in the Megillah, the text that we read on Purim, Layhudim Aita Ora Vesimcha Vesason Vikar. The Jewish people had light and joy, gladness, happiness, and honor for us and all humanity. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Israel for their statement. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned.